I need to make some better casting flasks. Uh, but what is a better casting flask anyway? And how would you make one? So to help me illustrate, we're gonna look at some of my old ones and perhaps see why they're not very good. I mean, they're fine. Also, they suck and I want better ones. Problem number one, they don't really sit flat both on the table and between the two flasks themselves. Now it's not good because it can make it difficult to like ram things up cleanly. Uh, also, if they don't fit, you can end up with like gaps where you don't want gaps. Second problem, the sand sometimes falls out of them. Now I've addressed that a bit by adding these inner ribs, but these ribs take up a lot of space and that's not so great. Next problem, alignment. So this one is this little alignment thing that, that you've seen in a video before. And I kind of like lift up to get them apart. And when you go to put them together, they kind of register together and that guides them kind of left and right. But you can see one problem here, they're not going back together. They bind uh, and that can, be, that can be kind of annoying. It's much more annoying when they weigh 50 pounds and they're full of sand. Also, how do you hold these things? Like this thing is just kind of smooth sided, but it's got this little thing that I can pick up, but I'm putting all 50 pounds or whatever on that little ridge on my fingers. That hurts. This one doesn't even have that. This is probably my least used one because uh, it's, it's annoying. Get rid of that. Next issue is probably easiest to demonstrate on these long ones. These are the ones they used for those swords, if you remember back in the day. Uh, when you start ramming sand up in the middle, it actually bows the sides out. Kind of a noticeable amount. Now there are a couple ways to get around that. If you if you own the Gingery book, he shows uh, casting the lathe bed actually as bracing. That's a good idea. I'm gonna do something else, and that's a good place to start making the new one. Here is the new one. Now I get it, they don't look all that different, but maybe compare it side by side with the old one. See it yet? There are different kinds of wood. Now there's a lot of things you can make flasks out of. I've seen people use angle iron welded together. That's fine. I've seen people make fancy 3D print ones and then cast them. That's really cool. Uh, but I put up a poll and said, what do you want me to do? And wood won. So here we are with wood. Now the difference here, the main difference, this is hickory. This is construction garbage lumber. Now it can be fairly difficult to describe what hickory is like to someone who has only used pine and, and other construction lumber. You have to pre-drill the holes for this, not just because it would split, but because there's no way you're driving a screw into hickory otherwise. Hickory also has a very, very, very high bending resistance. It is very difficult to get it to, to bow out at all. Pine is kind of like Twizzler candy. It's very flexible and it's really long. Another benefit of hickory, I suspect it's probably better at taking all the extra heat. I don't know that for sure. I do have a test coming up where I'm gonna test a bunch of different kinds of wood and their resistance to metal being poured close by. So stay tuned for that, but that's not gonna be today. So what do you do? Step one. I went to Menards, which is a Home Depot kind of store, and got hickory one by four. So these are three quarter by three and a half inches. They're mostly finished, they're kind of crap, but so is all wood at Menards. Before you cut it up, you form these grooves. You can find these recessed grooves in a gingery book picture, and they serve the same purpose as these things that stick out. Basically, the sand gets rammed around it, and this acts like little reinforcement to stop it from sliding out of the open box. Problem is, these things stick in into the sand area and kind of take up space. I've read somewhere, I can't confirm exactly where, where it was, that groove recessed in grooves actually work better at holding the sand than things like this sticking out. But I put in a bunch more. See, there's three per, per section. This is only one per section. And it's easiest to put those in when this is still in long board form. You can do that as I did here with either a hand plane. I have a grooving plane somewhere. It's very easy to buy or make. I made this one for doing like drawer bottoms. It gives you a quarter inch groove, a quarter inch deep, and you can set it up with a fence or something and run it. You can also use a table saw. Just run groove after groove after groove, moving the fence between it. Or you can use a router or any sort of things, just able to make grooves, step one. Step two, miter joints. Now these serve a couple of functions. First off, they hide the openings in the holes. Notice there's no holes poking through. That doesn't really matter because this isn't fine furniture. It's a box full of sand that you dump fire into. But miter joints have something else going for them. They are shockingly strong. Recently a woodworking YouTube channel called Bourbon Moth Woodworking, I think, did a test of different joints. Uh, they glued them all up and then put weights on, saw how much they could handle, and miter joints, glued miter joints, beat like so many others. Finger joints, dovetail joints. It was shocking how strong they are. Uh, the winner of the test, however, was splined miter joints. So you put a piece of wood kind of diagonal. Uh, that's why I took these miter joints, because I still don't trust glue all that much, and stuck screws in them, as opposed to these screw reinforced uh, butt joints. I don't even know if I glued these. I may have glued these. I don't trust the glue because the crap in this box is gonna be like 2,000 degrees and I don't trust the glue. A couple of screws, cheap insurance, just go for it. 
Next, to adjust this uh, sitting on the table problem, I made sure the bottom flask would sit flush on the table. I would just adjust it, you know, with a, with a hand plane. Then, did the same thing to make sure the fit was better than this one. Not only does it not rock on the table in either direction, the top doesn't rock on the bottom either. They fit perfect. Now I have to do this at this stage when you're building it, because as soon as you use it, sand is going to get embedded in the wood. I cannot go back and fix this one. Cannot believe how terrible that is. But there's sand just caked all over in that thing now. And I had to pay money for these tools. I don't want to ruin them. Next step, these side flanges. These do multiple jobs at once. Now these are glued along the parting line on the top and bottom and they don't quite touch. They're, they're maybe like a sixteenth of an inch away from the top-ish. They're close. And they're glued edge grain to edge grain, which is the strongest orientation of a glue joint. So this one I probably won't have to reinforce with screws, though I still might because I'm paranoid. And the reason they don't touch is because I connect them with a screw right here. Now this screw, like all the other ones, is pre-drilled and countersunk. This runs in through the top, goes into a hole in the bottom, and it will not go into that hole if it's not lined up perfectly. So putting it in that hole means that this is is aligned with this. So if I do the sand ramming in place, unscrew it, take it apart, take the pattern out, put it back together, put the screw back in, the top and bottom are now in exactly the same place perfectly as they were when I rammed it with the pattern inside. That means I will not have any, any shifting of the sand between, between ramming and pouring. The next thing they do, because there's a gap here, when this is actually tight, it's pulling these two together. It holds like a tension there, like squeezing them together. Hopefully that'll prevent molten metal from, you know, lifting the top up and then leaking out the edge. Because molten metal all over is no bueno. The next feature is that these line up perfectly and these surfaces line up perfectly. I achieved that by sticking them all together and then, you know, planing them, sanding them down so they're, they're dead even. The reason I did that is because when I'm lowering the top one, onto the bottom one, I want to be able to feel through my fingertips if the top or the bottom is shifted one way or another. And if I have a thumb sticking out here, I can tell if the top or bottom is shifted in the other dimension. As I'm lowering it down, I want to be able to just set the top and bottom directly together without having to shuffle them around. Now usually the parting line is pretty flat, so if you're offset and you have to like joggle it over, it's not a huge deal, but I'm going for like quality moving forward, so I kind of want this just to work. And then when I have it set back down, I'll run these screws back in. And the last problem, carrying it. How do you pick this up when it's full of sand? You struggle and grunt a lot and pray that you don't drop it. How do you pick this up when it's full of sand? Hands under these nice big flasks and just pick it up. It's a much bigger flange, much more secure than those little locating dowels. These screws, by the way, do poke through the bottom a little bit. I might shave those off or I'm gonna get some puncture wounds. I mean, I guess I could just go buy screws that aren't too long, but I didn't have those uh, on me. So how well does this actually work in practice? Uh, well, I'm out of time to show you. So uh, tune in to the next one and you'll see how it works. Okay.